Children across Britain are being exploited for sex by organised gangs in growing numbers. It is the most vicious, premeditated form of crime I have come across, short of homicide or terrorism. This is a very serious situation. We need to understand it, and then we need to not only prevent it, but we need to stop it. Last month, the Office of the Children's Commissioner said that up to 10,000 children could be at risk of exploitation by sex gangs. This is a very hidden crime. If you do not go looking for this type of crime, you will not find it. The victims of these crimes suffer abuse for months or even years as they're passed around groups of men. They did things where they locked me in a flat and put me in bedroom and just sent man after man in. And with most convicted men Pakistani and the authorities silent on the racial element, this crime is being used by the far right to fuel ethnic tensions. Who's the freedom? It's the media, isn't it? It's the media. Yeah. This right. gives a bad name, innit, to the Muslims community, to the people. That's why and what I'm about all about these yardies that come yeah, over well, and these Africans? What about the white guys that are raping their own daughters and stuff? Is it a ticking time bomb? No, I think it's already exploded. It's, you know, young men are out there now taking advantage of young, vulnerable girls, and we need to start doing something about that now. Gang grooming is a brutal crime in which girls, sometimes as young as 11, are tricked into a relationship before being sexually exploited. You're about to hear graphic accounts of rape. The girls who've chosen to speak out believe the only way to combat this abuse is to expose the horrific nature of this crime. Cases of gang grooming have only recently started to come to court, but girls have been secretly abused in this way for many years. A decade ago in Rotherham, Chloe had just started secondary school. How long have you been here? About two minutes. When I got to about 12, me and my friends started wanting to, like, just go out on weekends a bit. And we started to get befriended by yep. young boys who were probably, like, 14, 15. Like, you know, and they were different from boys in school because they didn't, like... They didn't wear tracksuit bottoms tucked into the socks. They sort of dressed nice and... You know, when, you th when you're like 12, 13, that's really important and you think they're a bit different. And we developed like, a friendship with these boys and we'd see them every weekend in arcades. You know, and we'd go to McDonald's and just hang around, really. Nothing strange, you know, we were having a good time, we were having a right good laugh. After a few months, the boys introduced Chloe and her friends to a group of older men. They'd give us alcohol and they'd give us spliffs and cigarettes. Did your parents have any idea? No, because I used to tell them, oh, I'm just going to go to my friend's house and you know, I'll be back for this time. And I always was back for the right time. One of them started to single me out. I used to spend all my time with him. I, know I quite liked it at the beginning because he got this... He'd got this thing about him where we were just sort of powerful. What happened on the first occasion? Tell me about that. It was winter, so it was really cold. And I said, oh, I'm right cold. And he put his arms around me um, from behind and started pushing me forward and said, I'll warm you up. Um, and then he took me around the corner. And then next thing I know, he got me on the floor and he was ripping my clothes off um, and there was a man holding my feet a man holding my arms and trying to put his penis in my mouth two men holding my friend um, and holding her eyes open and making her watch and he was on top of me raping me then there was other men stood watching and laughing my friend told me that it'd be alright and to stop crying so I sort of thought that it were normal because all these people around me were acting as though it were normal. And I'd convinced myself, by the next day, I'd convinced myself that maybe that's how you feel when you lose your virginity. Chloe was then raped almost daily after school by groups of men in parks, cars, flats and alleyways. 
but she was always dropped home before her parents needed to worry. Did you try to break away from them? No, because you don't have that choice. They've got full control over you through your mobile. They know everything about you. You know, and it's, if you don't go out and see them, then I'm going to come to your house and I'm going to gang rape my mum. Scared you? Yeah. So, well, they raped me, so why, why wouldn't you possibly have it arranged for them to gang rape my mum? You just don't have that choice. The sad thing is, is that you say now, and they'll also do what they're going to do anyway, but then they'll sort of give a bit of a punishment for saying no. Like what? Uh, like once I got raped anally. Um, on an alleyway, so you just... You know, the punishment is always worse than what they ask you to do anyway, so that's why it's easier to just do it, because otherwise you're going to get something worse. While most sex offenders who commit crimes against children alone white males, Chloe's abusers were all British Pakistani. In the 10 years since Chloe was abused, the vast majority of men convicted of this particular crime have been Pakistani and have worked in groups. <laughs> Chapman works for the charity Crop and supports parents whose children have been abused, like Chloe was. She's based in Leeds, but has seen the impact gang grooming has had on families all over the country. How does on-street grooming start? So girls can be targeted as, as young as 11 or 12, at the point they're really just hitting puberty, have really started high school. And it's really their, their access wherever young people hang out. So it can be a sibling of a perpetrator who initially introduced them via school. So somebody they think actually is their peer who they might get to know that way. It can be kind of outside school gates, shopping centres, parks, anywhere really where young people may even just be walking along the street. You might just see a situation where a car pulls up Winds down the windows, you know, it's quite good looking men in size, engaged in a little bit of banter. Girls quite flattered by the attention, get into a conversation with these guys, perhaps a mobile number's exchanged, or even just a name perhaps that you could look up on Facebook. You've got a point of access which these guys will later exploit. As that 13 year old girl, you know, you've got this guy who's maybe quite good looking, you know, really seems to shower you with attention. It's flattering. He says so many nice things about you. He calls you his princess, buys you things, seems to be really genuine. You think he's your boyfriend. He's always asking questions about you. He's always wanting to know how your life is, about your family. The key thing is that these guys are investing. They're investing time and money in girls that they target. Um, and what we'll see is, is a change in behaviour that goes with that grooming process. What do you know about where the girls are taken by the lads? So we know that they are taken to a variety of places, um, quite commonly um, flats, bedsits, cheap hotels, parks, car parks even, in the middle of the night. In this particular area, we know of a number of, of flats and houses that are being used for sexual exploitation. What happens to the girls once they get to these bedsits or to the car park or to a takeaway? We know of um, kind of anecdotal evidence of a number of places kind of being called party houses and um, it's seeming like a fun place to go and you know hence the party name but equally you can kind of find yourself there and actually it is very little of a party going on you are the only girl or one of only one or two and it is all men there and it's basically you are the party you are the one they're going to use for sex. A year ago, a case involving exactly this type of gang grooming hit the headlines. Nine men were convicted of abusing 27 girls aged 12 to 16 in Derby. Detective Superintendent Debbie Platt was in charge of the investigation. 30th of December 2008, we received an intelligence item from Staffordshire Police, which in essence was um, two of our 14-year-old girls who were missing from a care home in the city had been arrested with three males 
this was the first opportunity that we'd got names, addresses, dates of birth for three men. In the boot of the car, they'd got pornography, they'd got vodka, they'd got condoms. And they were clearly seen to be uh, following girls, predominantly schoolgirls, in the vehicle at a very slow pace. What we looked at, which was the critical aspect for me, was um, these men, uh, we believe, were part of an organised crime group. Once the gang was classified as an organised crime group, DS Platt was able to mount a covert surveillance operation to link the men with the girls. Traditional policing methods in this area do not work. If you're going to rely on your victim to come forward and give evidence and appear in a court of law and repeat that with no supporting evidence whatsoever, it is one word against another. I think the girls were generally in pairs and felt quite safe, so I don't think they were um, appreciated exactly what the intention of this group was. Because let's be clear about it, they only had one thing on their mind, um, and that wasn't to be a boyfriend or to be yes. a friend of any of these children. Get me quick. But some of the girls genuinely felt that they were the boyfriend and would go back to houses, to flats, they would go to parties, they would be offered girls. drink, they would be offered yeah. uh, alcohol predominantly. And it was a party just to go and chill. And it, literally that was the word that was used by most of our uh, girls, which was they were going to a party to chill. You can have a party. You can have a party tonight, aren't you, lads? All right, Cole, give me some, come on. Have a split. They were not expecting what happened once they were alone in those rooms. Come on, come on. Over the next few months, the police gathered evidence that led to the convictions of nine men. During the trial, the victims gave harrowing details of their ordeal. Two girls were threatened with hammers, and another was locked up, held prisoner, and then repeatedly gang-raped. The level of trauma, the control and manipulation, the fear of the perpetrators. If you're a child who's been exploited for two years, say, you know, you believe they're like gods. You believe they have that power. You believe that the police can't stop them. You believe that no one can. You believe this is your lot. So you continue to go back. Chloe was sexually abused for four months before her parents became suspicious and decided to check her mobile. They found the numbers of hundreds of men and immediately called the police. This is the first time Chloe's watched her initial police interview. So, what were you doing in your own this time? Why are you here today? Because this boy's forced me to have sex with him. He said to me, I'm going to shag you. And I said, and I told him that he's not because I didn't want to. And he said, yeah, but you want to, I know you want to. And then he started having sex with me again. I never ever once said I were raped. I said he had sex with me because I didn't know it were rape because I thought that were normal what he were doing. He told me that he had a special surprise lined up for me because he right liked me and that and I was his girl and stuff. Then we got in the car and I told him I didn't want to get in the car and he says just get in the car and know what's going to happen. And then he said to get my trousers down because he's, um, he's not messing about. He started grabbing my legs and that. And then he grabbed hold of my head and he was banging my head against the window and that. And then he started to have sex with me again. His mate was saying, oh, have you had enough, have you had enough? And he was saying, no, she hadn't had enough, have you? And he was telling me to scream and that. So just so young, wasn't I? Just think he's so sad. He said that I was just a white slag and stuff and he's going to have me sorted out and that and he's had enough of me now so he's going to start abusing me because now he's used me, he's going to abuse me. 
and then Eagles or you can go nah that's it I've had enough for you I'll see you later and that worked last time I saw him and that and that worked last time I seen him Cause, and that one that was sort of more upsetting to me than what what he'd done to what me you say, what? <laughs> yeah okay. more upsetting to me that that was last time I seen him and it were everybody else's fault that that was last time I'd seen him. The police decided not to take Chloe's case forward. Her abusers have never been prosecuted. The grooming process is so powerful and effective that very few perpetrators are ever convicted. Getting cases to and through the courts when the girls don't see themselves as victims is often the biggest challenge. It can take months, even years, for the girls to fully accept and understand how they have been exploited. In Leeds, youth worker Becky Jones has handled dozens of cases of girls who are being gang groomed. 15-year-old Abby is still being abused. Becky has been fighting to keep her away from her abusers for the last two years. In back of here, back of there. And what happened down there? That's where I first gave one of them a blowjob because she says they wouldn't tell my mum. When you were 13? Yeah. I mean, across Leeds, sexual exploitation is a massive problem. The girls are told this is, this is how you behave. You have sex with other people. If you don't, you're a bit, you know, immature or you're a bit out of touch. And I think the girls just gradually get used to it. And some of the lads are very clever in terms of I've had quite a few girls saying, oh, no, they don't want to have sex with me. They, you know, they really respect me. The guys will wait a week, a month, however long, and then the pressure will start. So the girls have been kind of lulled into this false sense of security that this isn't about sex, this, this guy is OK. What happened at this park? This is where it all happened with the rape, with the first time when I was 13. This is where they brought me. Went off from like 7 o'clock when it started getting dark. It was like 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And did lots of different men keep arriving or were they yeah. all there from the start? Some of them stayed, then more people came, and then some of them left, then more people came. Mm. And did they all know each other, do you think? Yeah. And how many men do you think were there that night? More than 20, I think. So did you report this to the police? Yeah. They investigated, but there wasn't much evidence against them to charge them. Because it was my word against theirs. How do you feel when looking back and being at the park? I was still sick. I think in terms of the girls, I sit in meeting after meeting after meeting talking about the girls. How can we get the girl out of the situation? How can she get herself out of the situation? And it can get very frustrating when no one's talking about the men and how do we target them? The men who commit these crimes are hard to find. Their world is secret and deeply hidden. The two guys in Sheffield agree to talk to us on condition their faces are not shown. They say they know men who groom girls for sex and are willing to explain the process. You take her to a place where you're well known. You're shaking a load of people's hands that looks good on you. And that girl thinks you're someone. You do that a few times, then she'll start feeling for you. You talk every night on the phone. As soon as you talk every night on the phone, yeah. you make the girls fall in love. They fall in love. Yeah. And once they fall in love with a guy, then they do anything for him. But at the end of all, that guy don't really give a shit about her. At what point does money get involved? Money gets involved whenever it wants to, really. They can say, I've got this straight nice girl, she looks like a model, whatever. I want so much for her, and I'll pass her. But how, how much money are we talking about here? Depends what the girl looks like, how she is, her build, the size. 
one girl could have sex for what, 30 pounds and then there's another one she could go for 10 pounds why girls so young like why 13 year old girls why not older girls because the younger girls easy to take advantage because they're 18 19 don't really fall for little things like that they listen because they're vulnerable and once she's so they can't get out they can never get out well, people pay more for younger girls. The younger the girl, the more money they Oh, because um, you say she's a virgin, they get the pleasure of you breaking a virginity. They're tired of whore for the guy, really, and the better the pleasure. Okay, what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is why are these blokes doing it? Are they doing it because, you know, they're frustrated blokes trying to get a young girl to have sex with them because older girls won't? Or are they doing it because they're trying to make some money out of the, these girls? Or are they doing it for both reasons? Most people do for money. Because it's not easy to find a job these days. Sometimes just the easiest option, like stealing, it's got more consequences to it. Guys see it as every hole's a goal. Everyone sees it as that, everyone. Gang grooming has been going on for at least a decade, but figures on the scale of the problem are virtually non-existent. The only reliable data are recent convictions. We analysed Crown Court trials over the last five years. In 14 cases, two or more men have been found guilty of grooming and then sexually abusing children. Our research has found that in these cases, out of the 46 men convicted, 40 have been Pakistani. I would say 80% of the girls I've worked with are sleeping with, with Asian Pakistani men. So what's happening in the Pakistani community that's resulting in individuals being involved in this particular type of offending? That's a big question that we need to ask ourselves. <laughs> While the authorities remain silent on the race issue, the far right are filling the vacuum. Most of the paedophilic rapes happen in this country from, from within the Muslim community. No surrender! The vast majority of sex offenders are white and known to their victims. But several recent high-profile cases have put the spotlight on a different pattern of abuse that has been hidden for too long. Here, groups of men groom young girls for sex and then pass them on to others to be raped and gang raped. In 2010, after a two-year police investigation in Derby involving 27 victims, nine men were found guilty of serious offences. These included rape, false imprisonment, sexual assault and sexual activity with a child. When the ringleaders in the Derby case were sentenced, the English Defence League were outside the court. They were quick to capitalise on the ethnic background of the perpetrators, even though one of the nine convicted men was white. We are standing outside this court today in protest of these members of the Islamic community that have been charged with disgusting crimes and pedophilic rape and pimping. The two ringleaders, Muhammad Liaquat and Abid Sadiq, were jailed for 38 years between them. What do you think of those that have been involved? They are sexual predators, exactly what the judges said. They are sexual predators, and this was all about sexual gratification against vulnerable young girls. Times journalist Andrew Norfolk has been investigating cases like these for the last year. As each year passed, these cases would crop up involving two or more men being convicted of child sex crimes. The one thing I couldn't help noticing every time one of these cases cropped up was that these were Asian names. Time and again, you'll hear police forces saying ethnicity is utterly irrelevant to this type of offending. We treat every offence on its own merits if wrongdoing. 
is taking place, we will address it. And that's fine as well, except in any other type of crime, if a pattern was staring you in the face like this, then you'll say, we need to understand why this is happening. And, and, and it's that, that question that I don't think is, has, has really ever been addressed in this country. You know, we have to find a way that we don't associate the entire community. We have to put it in context. Out of 1.2 million British Pakistani Kashmiris, even one is one too many. But, you know, obviously we need to put it into context that these are criminals. They need to be dealt with. They need to be locked up. Should the fear of being accused of being racist or stirring up racial hatred stop us from talking about this openly? Well, it shouldn't, but it has been doing. Because whenever you try to uh, be honest about this problem, uh, then unfortunately the uh, English Defence League, uh, League and British National Party hijack this and then people just close in. I mean, th these horrible men also did it with Asian girls too, Muslim girls too. So, you know, if you put it in context of the victim rather than the colour of the victim or the background of the victim, I think it, might, it would be much better and you would be able to, we would be able to deal with it. The British National Party will not stand by and watch these girls feed and are being systematically raped, dropped and abused by Muslim beautiful perverts. Whenever a case came to court this year, the English Defence League or the British National Party were there. What would you say to that? I, uh, their message, which is that this is all about Islam, that this is a, a crime committed by Muslims against non-Muslims, is utterly bogus and false. Do you think that they've hijacked this issue? But from the start, and they were allowed to, that's the trouble. Our children are not allowed beach. This has been a crime so controversial and repugnant that few have been willing to talk about it. Fear of stoking racial hatred has stunted open debate on why so many Pakistani men are involved. The guys I talked to in the kebab shop offered to take me to meet other Pakistani lads to gauge their views on gang grooming. You see, nowadays girls walk around in bloody mini skirts and these children will just ask for it. How can you keep saying that? I don't understand why you, how you can keep saying I, that. Me, how does a 12, 13 or 14 year old ask for it from a whole gang of men? They show off their bits and their butts, start showing the ones to them. But she's been forced to have sex with not just one man, but multiple men. Her family's being threatened. I mean, do you think that's right? On any level, do you think that's right? Yeah, it's not right, but it happens, you know? There's a group of one standing on there. Yeah. They're just yeah. chilling. Okay. This is, a, this oh, is the every day for us. So how old are these guys? They're all various, various. It's all about them underage girls. Do you want to tell me about that? No, but how come you think every Asian's like that? <laughs> right, there are these really high-profile cases, aren't there? Like yeah. Telford, Derby. You hear about these Pakistani men who are involved with these young girls, yeah. you know, who put them through all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as, a, as Asian, young Asian men... Look, Asian men, they've no, gambling look, and Asian men. What is it? Why Asians? No, no, because I'm telling you about these cases. Yeah. That's why I'm asking you about it. what about all these yardies that come yeah, well, over and these Africans? Yeah, so what about the white guys that are raping their own daughters and stuff? Okay, let, let me just ask you this question, right? As Asian men, when you see this out there, yeah, when, you, when you hear about... Like, other Pakistani men doing this to young girls. What do you think? That's it's what I'm trying to get to. What do you think about it? It gives a bad name, innit, to the... The Muslims, to the, to the, the Muslims community, themselves. to the people, the bad people, people everywhere, aren't they? We're not all like every colour guys, white guys, this and that. You don't yeah, think you're really And what about, about what should society do about the guys who are doing this? If you go for girls under the age of 16, you're fucked in your head, aren't you? And you've got problems. End of. You deserve to die, in my, my opinion. You deserve to die, burn. Everything. Most of the time, the girls uh, they mess about themselves. You've got to blame the parents as well for letting them go out and hang around with these lads and let them go out at daft times, isn't it? Like, you walk around here, yeah, but 11, 12 o'clock at night, you see 13, 14 year old girls walking about in, in tight clothes and. <laughs> 
Yeah. Are those girls asking Sorry. for it? Do you think those girls yeah, are they're asking, asking for it? No, you can't say that. They're not asking for it because it's wrong what's happening to them. But if they didn't dress in that certain way, they wouldn't be approached in that way. If they wasn't out at them times of night, they wouldn't be approached by them people. Chloe was groomed 10 years ago in the South Yorkshire town of Rotherham. She now works with other young girls who are going through the same experience. Some people say the girls are to blame. Why do the girls dress like that? Why don't their parents know where they are at 10, 11 or 2 in the morning? The children. They're not women. They're not 18 year olds going to a nightclub. The children. They wear tracksuit bottoms and trainers. They dress as children dress. These men that were on about, they're not, they're not kids, they're men, they're grown men. Now, I'm an adult. If I were in a situation with a 12-year-old boy and he tried it on with me, as a responsible adult and an adult who's got, who knows right from wrong, I would say no. The responsibility don't fall on child. Why do you think they make that argument over and over again then? I feel that sometimes um, it might make it easier to cope with what's happening if we make out that these kids are running about in short skirts um, and belly tops and they're throwing themselves at these men. Rotherham hit the headlines last year when five men were sentenced to 32 years between them for sexual offences against children. Rizwan Razak was found guilty of raping a 16-year-old. His younger brother, Umar, was found guilty of sexual activity with a child. Their father has never spoken to the media before, but he has agreed to talk to me because while he accepts his sons were guilty, he also feels let down by police and social services. I'm angry with the girls involved. I'm angry with my lads involved. I'm certainly angry with the system that's failed these girls and these men. If the system were right, if social services looked after these girls properly, if police their jo did their job properly, these girls wouldn't have been there knocking about 11 o'clock at night, and these lads wouldn't have gotten involved with them. Rizwan believed that she was older than 16, and all the evidence suggests that she looked older than 16. And obviously she wasn't a virgin or new to sex. So you don't see it as rape? Uh, well, uh, I don't. And she's 13. She's 13 years old. Uh, well, yes, obviously, that's the, some responsibility lies for it. But as far as grooming is concerned, I think that the judge has gone over the board, the jury has gone over the board, the police has gone over the board, just because these lads are Asian. Is there any um, reflection within Pakistani Asian communities that we should try and do something about this? Yes, if you're talking about grooming the girls, then I would be very ashamed if I find any Asian Muslim, especially Muslim, grooming young girls for sex or any other uh, illegal uh, activity. The parents of these girls have failed to control these girls. The police have failed to note that these underage girls were knocking about in town. And that's led to it. Simple as that. Mr. Razak is not alone in blaming the girl's parents, but experts say the groomers are so calculating that even the most well-intentioned parent can be fooled. We went to meet a couple whose daughter was just 12 when she fell into the hands of a sex gang. The question a lot of people are asking is, how did you, as loving, devoted parents, not know this was going on with your daughter? It's the hardest thing in the world to accept that this might be happening to your own child. It's such an appalling thought. You look for other explanations. We asked for help from social services, but they didn't think that anything of this nature was going on. At that stage, we didn't understand it. But it was quite clear that social services, the police and the other agencies, they didn't have a clue either. How did her behaviour change? She became very secretive, much less. Less open. It became harder and harder to have conversations with her. Because of the effect of the grooming, there, there became this absolute block on communication from her to us. 
Did they turn her against you? Oh, yes, they turned her against us. Painted us as horrible people who didn't understand her, whose last mission was to prevent her from having any fun. The abusers know exactly what to look for. They're very, very skilled. So I think any child's vulnerable. Has it been a taboo to talk about the race and ethnicity issue in all of this? As soon as you bring in the issue of race or ethnicity, there's a hush, there's a silence. Nobody wants to go there. It's almost like the elephant in the room. As soon as you link ethnicity and race with behaviour, by definition, you're a racist. How significant do you think that is? I think it's very significant. If you say there's some kind of relationship which we don't fully understand between race, ethnicity and child sexual exploitation, that's something that has to be unpacked and explored rather than denied. The disproportionate number of British Pakistani men convicted for this crime has shaken local communities. In 2005, after a major operation spanning two years, police interviewed around 50 victims of grooming in Keithley, West Yorkshire. Ten men were charged and two were convicted. Youth worker Shaquille Aziz grew up here and has watched his community try to come to terms with this. How long has grooming been a problem here? I'd say since I've been working in youth work for the last seven or eight years, I've definitely come across it. Over time, it is unfortunately growing. More and more young lads are becoming involved in, in the grooming issues. What are these guys like? How would you describe them? These are young lads who are <clears throat> mentally inactive and socially inactive. They're involved in crime, drugs. It's somebody who doesn't work with young people might see them and think they're normal lads, but really internally, uh, mentally and socially, they're very disconnected from society. Uh, taking advantage of a young girl, to them, it's a laugh. It doesn't occur to them the damage and the absolute evil that they are causing to another person's life and the community around them. Don't they realise that what they're doing is, is wrong? Uh, in absolute truth, no, they don't. So they won't go shoplifting. They won't steal from a shop because they know that's against the law but they're willing to take advantage of a young white girl. Why do you think they're targeting white girls rather than Asian girls, Pakistani girls? These communities know each other, families know each other. The young lads cannot target a young Asian girl without some repercussion on them. They will get dealt with, that's the truth of it. Young girls, white girls are unfortunately more vulnerable. Do you think they're making a lifestyle choice? You know, if the younger lads are seeing the older ones doing this and benefiting from it. The role models that these young lads are looking up to are flash cars, money, some kind of criminal, you know, style. Um, and yeah, easy access to women and sex. That's, that's, that's what they think, that's what they want. Poor role models and social isolation may be part of the reason for the rise in gang grooming. But others say a distorted view of sex among some men is also a key factor. Ilyas Kermani is an imam and counsellor who runs sex education classes in London and Bradford. Why would a young Pakistani man think it's acceptable to befriend a young girl of 11 or 12 mm -hmm. and then have sex with her and then force her to have sex with you know, some of his friends or peers? If you live in a tightly knit community, if you're going out, if you have a girlfriend openly, you're married in an arranged marriage, this is something obviously which is going to bring even more criticism and, and opposition from your community. You're not going to go out partying, you're not going to have a normal relationship, uh, you know, in terms of having uh, a girlfriend. So you're probably, talking about a double identity? It, it's, it's what we call double life syndrome. And so as a result of this double life syndrome, people will, will, will be engaged in underground activity. Do you think that that double life is the core reason why this happens? I think there's three broad reasons. One is a failure in terms of sex education. And I think a lot of people from Pakistani and Asian backgrounds in sex education are completely disengaged. The second reason is arranged marriages. We're not talking about forced marriages here. We're talking about individuals who will marry often spouses from abroad and uh, they find they can't connect with them at all. On an emotional level, social level, linguistic level even, and certainly not on a sexual level as well. So they feel deeply unfulfilled in their marriages. And as a result of that, this paradigm has evolved. You have your respectable family and cultural life, you have your children, but then also there is a certain proportion who then fall into this underground culture where there is 
sexual activity taking place, uh, girls who are available, and so they'll be boiled and pulled into that culture. And the third reason is over-sexualized societies. We're in societies where we have access to hardcore, degrading, humiliating pornography. And so for a lot of young men, they just have very distorted and confused ideas about respect for women as well. While there is an uncomfortable silence from the authorities, the Pakistani community says it's time to face the facts. Statistics do show that the problem stems from the Pakistani community, so we have to take a responsibility. Their parents didn't do it, their grandparents didn't do it, and there's no excuse for them to get involved with this type of crime. Charlie ran off, unleashing you on a frantic search around town. Meanwhile on Nextdoor, your neighbor John already found Charlie. Nextdoor. Download today. Hi Linda. Looks like you've got a prescription to fill. Any idea how much that's going to cost in there? The exact same drug that's $10 at this pharmacy is $150 at this one. GoodRx finds prices and discount coupons on every prescription. Just input the drug name and instantly find savings at virtually every pharmacy in America. Next. What can I do for you? Here's my prescription, and I have a coupon from GoodRx. Nice price. Stop paying too much for your prescriptions with GoodRx. Last decade, there's been a rise in the brutal sexual abuse of young girls by gangs of men. Figures from the last four years show that the majority of men convicted for these crimes are British Pakistanis. We've been told a distorted view of women and sex among some Pakistani men is one possible reason for the rise in these gangs. In Sheffield, a group of Pakistani women were keen to have their say about this crime. As women from these communities, from Pakistani communities, Asian communities, seeing that the men in your community are doing this, what is your sort of gut reaction to that? What's your first reaction to it? We do have a problem, and obviously it is more like Asian boys who are grooming these girls. And how do we tackle that? I mean, do we blame the parents? I think parents sometimes don't have the confidence to talk to their children about sex and, and, and about exploitation and, and where, you know, that it should be the um, same age and um, the age of consent and uh, all the rules and everything. I've got two children. I would talk about it. As the new generation of parenting will talk about it. It's our parents that it was a taboo for. What would their reaction be if they knew that their sons were up to this kind of thing, do you think? They'll be shocked. I don't think any parent would want to know that their child is doing something like that. It's disgusting, yes. Disgusting. Yes. I wouldn't like it to happen to my 12-year-old daughter, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It would make me very angry, and I would want that person locked up. But while the Pakistani community is now speaking out, the government and the police are still hesitant to mention specific ethnic groups. The Police Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre did some initial research on gang grooming earlier this year. Only 12% of local authorities responded. But based on very patchy data, although a third of men associated with gang grooming were white, Asian men were massively overrepresented in the figures. Families we've spoken to are saying that nobody's prepared to tackle the race issue, nobody's prepared to put their heads above the parapet because they're scared of racial sensitivities. Nobody's taking leadership on this. Members of the Pakistani community are coming forward and saying we need to deal with this. Why are you being so cautious on the race issue? I'm not being cautious on the race issue. I think what I'm trying to do is make sure that people don't arrive at a false impression of the kind of person they're at risk from and a per the kind of person they are safe from. If you're in the business of protecting the public and making sure that victims are aware of how to manage the risks themselves, you have to tread extremely cautiously, uh, cautiously in um, not misleading them to fear one kind of person and uh, therefore trust another. There is no doubt, however, there is no doubt that some of the cases do involve uh, large groups of males of one particular ethnicity. My point is this, um, if everybody knows that, 
if everybody's aware of it, what are they doing about it? This is one of the most serious, uh, pernicious, nasty, harmful forms of crime there is. If people know it's going on within any community, they should do something about it. Youth worker Shaquille Aziz is doing something about it. He's using the teachings of Islam to wipe out gang grooming in his hometown of Kifu. We take things from an Islamic perspective in our work and this is a very important aspect of our work is that this sexual grooming issue is strictly against the teachings of Islam. So if we're saying that the majority of these young Pakistani guys are Muslims and involved in sexual grooming, then what we as an organization are teaching them is that's a very serious problem there because you cannot claim to be a practicing person who abides by the religion of Islam and then at the same time you're involved in such evil actions as sexual grooming. Shaquille has been working with Alias Kirmani to develop a workshop that tackles the problem of grooming and sexual exploitation of young girls. So what is street grooming? It's a new term, and this is one of the high-profile cases that there's been. It was in Derby, where these two guys were picking up girls as young as 12 years old for sex. Some research has shown that there is a large number of Asian men who are involved in this, in particular people from Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds. I don't know, what, what do people think about that? This is probably the first time I've ever heard someone like yourself bring, okay. uh, bring this up in front of so many people. I grew up with all these lads over here, and we've never ever sat down and had a conversation about this. Okay. I went to a majority white school where majority of the people were white and I was just one, one, of the, one of a number of Asians in there. And there was young girls who were like 14, 15 in my school we were, which were going out with 21, 22, 23 year olds mm -hmm. which, seemed, which was, seemed to be alright. So you, the boundaries of what is acceptable is a what? bit confusing. Yeah? No one's actually addressing those issues. No? Nobody's addressing okay. those issues, no. Uh -huh. Elias, is this part of the solution? I think it's definitely part of the solution. Uh, I think what we've got here is young people talking about the issue. And I think what's important, taking responsibility for the issue as well. I think, you know, there's a view that somehow people are, want to brush this issue under the carpet. That's not the case at all. And as you can see, most of the young people we're working with, they have a very strong moral compass. And their role is that, you know, where there are women and children who are being victimized in this particular way, they have a responsibility to challenge that behavior. Statistics do show that the problem stems from the Pakistani community, so we have to take a responsibility. Um, but mainstream society also has to take the responsibility and accept that the fact that this is not an exclusive Pakistani problem. Um, We've all made a stand together to say we know this is a problem, we're disgusted by it, this is not what we are. We are proud British men, we are proud Muslims, and our religion and our values as British and Muslim people does condemn this altogether. When then people are sentenced and sent to prison for us to say, you know what, that was a good thing. Yes. That was someone's daughter, that was someone's sister, that someone raped. So you know what, that man deserves to go to prison. And for us to stand up and say that justice has been done is a way of showing that we won't accept this behaviour. Morally, ethically, religiously, in every way, in, in every sense as well as legally, this is a criminal act and it must not happen. But more importantly, even the parents, the community leaders, and the religious leaders, lead, leaders need to accept that this is a problem. Once you know you accept that there's a problem, then you can deal with the problem uh, you know, in different ways. But if you don't accept it, if you're closing in and saying, ah, oh, this is an attack on our culture, this is an attack on our community, we're under attack again, nobody is going to deal with it. As a support worker, I want to make sure that my clients are safe. I want to make sure that they're not a risk of harm from perpetrators. To me, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the colour of the skin is of those perpetrators. That doesn't mean that I can support my client any better. What could help me to support my client better or to do better preventative work would be to know, is there a pattern with these perpetrators? Is there a pattern in terms of generational issues being passed down? Is there a pattern in terms of cultural issues being passed down and attitudes going through the whole community that could be challenged and addressed? That's the sort of thing that I want to know as a support worker so that we can actually use that information to stop this happening. The true scale of gang grooming is still unknown, 
but recent research has found that three quarters of local authorities are not doing enough to tackle it. The government is finally launching a national action plan later this month, but there's little hope that there'll be any new funding to raise awareness or support the girls. And without significant funding and a clear-cut strategy on race, how many more victims like Chloe will fall prey to these sex gangs? No matter where you go in country, grooming is still the same. It's as though they've all been taught at a special school what to do. They get away with it all the time. Do you think things can change? I think it's got to a point things have got that bad and it's got that out of control that to change it will take a very, very long time. Especially don't think that government's interested in doing that. You know, they'll chuck a bit of funding in for 12 months, but when a problem's this big, 12 months don't solve it. Now, average age is like 12, so they're getting younger. Like, there's referrals for 11-year-olds. The younger they are, the more they're worth. And I think that they've got away with it for so long. You can get away with it with a 13-year-old, so why not try an 11-year-old? <laughs>